So first off, I just want to say that these four chairs up here are not for Nikki and I. Um, we were short at 36 chairs, so we have more coming next week and we'll fill out the rows here. So we weren't trying to separate ourselves there. <laughs> Jesus, I just pray once again you would bring your word to life. Lord, I, I just... I sense you trying to change my heart through, through this message that you're speaking to my heart. And I just pray that you would, um, you would change all of our hearts and that you would be the one speaking today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you ever feel like life is, is one thread away from unraveling? <laughs> You ever feel like there's just so much going on and, you know, maybe you're just juggling away and, you know, you're just, it's about ready to just come crashing down. Um, you know, this week there's just been a ton of things going on. I mean, I, if I tried to go down the list, I, I know I would forget some. And whenever you have unexpected things that come in, it just, man, it can just, turn you into a tailspin. Um, last week, one of the major things that, that happened to my family and I is that uh, my truck broke down. And so suddenly that just throws a wrench in, in so many things. But part of what I want to share this morning is just the ways that God has provided through that. Um, a couple weeks ago, my wife had me chasing off to Missouri um, to haul back something I'm not even going to mention, but it was this huge load, okay? And the load ended up, I, I was pulling a trailer with my truck, and the load ended up being just crazy big, and it was just so heavy, and we were out in the hills and haulers of Missouri, and I was wrapping that truck out, just trying to get that load home. And loading the things up that we loaded took much longer than I thought. And by the time we were headed home, I mean, I'm just ready to be home. I'm worn out. But the Lord saw us back. And so even though my truck broke down a week later, I was so grateful to the Lord that it didn't happen in Missouri with a load on my truck. If it had happened then, there would have been so many other complications and so much other money that was spent. But instead, where my truck broke down was, I was just driving by Casey's, you know, 15 miles an hour, and all of a sudden something starts breaking loose, and I'm able to pull into food land uh, and stop it, so that a friend was able just to back right up and hook me up and, and pull me home. And it just wasn't that big of a deal. And also through that, I made a few phone calls. And before I had the truck hooked up, I had somebody who said, hey, why don't you use my truck to drive? And I was so blessed by that because it wasn't just any truck. It was a truck that I was able to haul hay with the next day, which I needed my truck for. And so the Lord was just providing. And then on top of that, somebody swung by that I knew and said, hey, you need a trailer. Well, I was able to use their trailer to take the truck to a mechanic to get it fixed. And then on top of that, the truck that I had borrowed to drive, it wouldn't start this morning at, in the front of the church. And so some of the ladies thought I was taking their parking spot, and I apologize for that. Uh, but it wouldn't start. But then there was somebody else here that said, take my truck. And so the moral of the story is, don't let me drive your vehicle because it will break down. <laughs> somebody said, well, maybe you just need a Chevy. But anyways, I don't know. Maybe when I can afford one, I don't, you know, we'll see. But here's the thing I want to share with you. What the Lord has shown me is that through the struggles, and, I, and again, that seems minor, okay, and it is, but the problem is, is that it's in the midst of a million other things that are in our lives. And what the Lord is showing me is that He has been working on my behalf. 
Because in the midst of whatever struggles that you're going through, the enemy comes in and he tries to get you to think about, well, what are you going to do if this happens? And what are you going to do if this happens? And what are you going to do if this happens? And if this isn't working, well, then what about that? And we start thinking about all these things and we're like, ah, oh. you know, maybe you're in a place where you're just barely paying the bills. And you're thinking, man, if, if this breaks down or this happens, I'm going to be I'm going to be doomed. I, I, I'm there. There's no way. I mean, everything's just going to unravel and you can just get to a, in a place where you, you're you're just you just don't know what to do. You just feel overwhelmed. But the thing that I want to share with you is that when we trust God and trusting God means listening to him and following him. He will work on our behalf. Think about this. What if your little problems, okay, and they seem huge because they seem huge to me, but my problems in comparison to the world's problems are, are pretty small. But can you imagine, what if the creator of the universe wants to work on your behalf? And, and just to begin to take care of things. The truth is, he does. He wants to do that. Your problems. He loves you. You enough that he wants to do that. But here's the thing. In order for that to happen, I've got a sign that, that, that hangs in our house that I don't always follow, but it says something to the point of, Jesus, take the reins. Because you're the one who created me. You're the one that knows what's going to happen. But here's the thing. In order for Jesus to take the reins or to take the wheel as the song goes, you've got to take your hands off. And you've got to say, Lord, you handle it. Now that doesn't mean I just lay down and don't do anything, no. But what it means is, is that day by day and moment by moment, I ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do now? And I don't sit around and try to figure everything out and form this great big plan and then you know, follow it step by step. I know there's a lot of books on success that will tell you to do those kinds of things. But I don't find that in here when it talks about following the Lord. Because the Lord always does things in the weirdest ways. He does things in non-commonsensical ways. Over and over He does it. Why? Because here's the deal. He not only will work on your behalf, He wants to. Because he wants you to feel that love. And when you feel that love in the midst of your problems and whatever's going on, when you're like, man, I wouldn't have made it out of there alive if God hadn't stepped in, you feel loved. And that's what he wants you to feel. But here's the thing. We must trust him enough. And so I want to talk about this morning a little bit about what it looks like to trust him. Because it's so easy to say, yes, I trust him. OK, I can sit up here and preach about it and so on. But I'll tell you right now, I've got areas in my life where I'm not fully trusting him. I'm, I'm grabbing on and I'm grabbing on tight and he keeps revealing more and more of those to me. Not to shame me, not to condemn me, but to set me free. And I know he wants to do that for every one of us. So as we go through this this morning, I just want you to, I want to ask that you just open up your heart and just invite the Lord to speak because he wants to set you free in some stuff here. He wants to go to work for you. But in order for that to happen, you've got to say, OK, God, I'm going to let you. Because if you keep saying, I got this, I got this, because you think that's what he wants to do, he He's not going to take the reins from you. He's going to let you hold on to him. The scripture I want to look at this morning is Hebrews. The very last verse in chapter 3 is where I want to start. And I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation this morning. Um, I really like how the New Living puts some of this. And, and you know, one of the things I just want to say, there, there's a lot of different translations out there. One of the things I, I like about the New Living, if you read about what they try to do with it, they don't try to, to uh, translate every little word. They try to translate the thought and what God's really trying to say through it. And I like that because some of the other stuff, it just, man, it gets confusing. So anyways, that was a side note. I don't know what it has to do with anything, but there you go. All right, 319 says this. So we see 
that they were not allowed to enter his rest because of their unbelief. Now, first of all, let, let me supply some context before we go on. He's right before that in chapter three, he was talking about when God had led the Hebrews out of slavery and he was getting ready to lead them into a promised land. Now, again, just like my life and your life, that doesn't mean we just sit down and God does everything. No, it just means that we ask him what to do day by day and we follow him. And God was teaching the Hebrews that he did it by providing manna. He did it by providing water where there was none. He did it by overtaking an army that would have knocked them out, you know, in commonsensical terms. OK, but God stepped in and worked on their behalf. But in spite of all that, when they got to the promised land and God said, go in, fight them, I'm going to work on your behalf. They didn't look at God. They just looked at themselves and they said, they're so much bigger. They're so much more powerful. We can't do it. And because of that, it says they didn't enter God's rest. Now, what did that mean? It didn't mean that they were going to go into this land and just lay around on couches while everything was brought to them. It meant they were going to go in and work the land and so on. But here's the thing that they were going to have. They were going to have a restful life. They were going to work, certainly. But God was going to provide fruit for their work. You ever feel like you work and work and never see any fruit? Well, it could just be that that's because you're doing it all yourself. And you are not inviting God to work on your behalf. And I just want to say to you, you can stop it. You can stop it right now. But you must ask the Lord what he wants you to do. You can't just say, I'm going to go do this and say a little prayer. Oh, God bless me. No, that's not how it works. You say, God, what do you want me to do? And then we step in. So they were not allowed to enter God's rest because they did not trust him. They looked at themselves. So what is it in your life right now where you're looking at yourself and going, oh, no, I don't have enough money and I don't know how to make more. Oh, no, I'm supposed to accomplish this and I don't know how it's going to happen. I, I don't know how I've kept things together, you know, this long. Well, the key is stop looking at yourself. If you are a child of God and you are trusting in him, start looking at him and start saying, oh, wow. I wonder what God's going to do with this problem. This is going to be awesome because it looks overwhelming and it looks like there's no way out. But when I look at what God does in his word and when I look at what God does when I've trusted him, man, he does things through ways you never saw coming. And he loves to do that. Verse one in chapter four says God's promise of entering his place of rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to get there. Okay, so ultimately one day we're going to enter the fullness of God's rest. Okay, heaven is going to come to earth. We're going to live in the presence of Jesus. The curse is going to be taken away and we're going to see abundant fruit for our work. We're still going to work. You're not going to sit around and float on a cloud. You're going to work, but you're going to see abundant fruit and it's going to bless your heart and it's going to be good. But you know what? We are able to see a portion of that here and now. We are able to see a portion of fruit way beyond our labors when God works on our behalf. But here's the key, belief. And belief means that you listen, first of all, and you trust him with your action. OK, so I want to talk about one that really shows whether we're trusting with our action, because this just said we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to get there. Um, I, I, I have some I have some concerns. OK, one of the places that really shows and, and let me say this, OK, all of us have some places where we're probably trusting the Lord and all of us have some places where we're probably not trusting the Lord. OK, so I don't want to just hit on, you know, one particular issue. I want to I want to look at all the different ones. OK, but I want to talk about 
one issue, um, and that is money. <laughs> and I'm not a big money talker, but man, it's, it is one of those places where am I trusting God? Well, one of the things that God asks for is a tithe. So let me ask you, are you tithing? Now, I can answer back that probably less than 50% of us sitting in here are, okay? Um, I can look at that just by looking at our finances. Um, if all of us tithed, whoo, I mean, we, there's so many more things that, that, that we could do, but we don't, okay? Why don't we? Here it is, because we don't believe. You can say what you want, we don't believe. Now, we can say things like, well, you know, if I had this and this lined out, well, then I would start giving. There's probably less than, I don't know, there's probably like 2% of us in here that are in a financial position where, you know, we've got just all kinds of extra and we can just give and give. Most of us are not in that position. Most of us, <laughs> like me, have a truck break down, and instead of going and getting something different, you're putting a new engine in it because you can't afford something that has 200,000 miles on it because prices are ridiculous. But you know what? I'm going to tithe. You know why I'm going to tithe even though I can't afford a vehicle with less than 200,000 miles on it? I'm going to tithe because of what I've seen God do. Because when I tithe, He works on my behalf. Now, does he always provide a new vehicle? No. Sometimes he provides a tow from Cesar Foodland and provides a way for me to get a new engine in it. But he provides, okay? And that's part of it. I've got to say, God, you tell me what I need. Instead of me saying, well, I want this, God, and I deserve this. No, you don't get to do that. You ask God what, what he wants to give you, okay? But when you trust Him, that means that you put your faith into action. It's one thing to say, oh yes, I trust God. But when you're looking at your checkbook and you're looking at your bills and it doesn't add up, that's where the rubber meets the road. Do you tithe at that point? If you don't, and I'm saying this out of love, you don't trust Him. And what he, here's what's happening when you do that. You're taking the reins and you're saying, I got this, God. Let me just say this. There's a better way. Here's what you can do. You can tithe, and here's what you do in that action. You give God the reins, and you say, God, I trust you, and God goes to work on your behalf. And he changes things. You see, my truck could have broke down in Missouri with a load behind me, and it could have been a catastrophe if that had happened. But it didn't. Why? Because I believe God was working on my behalf. Now, you can always look at bad things that happen and say, oh, oh, well, where was God during that? But you can always look at the ways that he's provided when you trust in him. And he will provide. He will go to work on your behalf. Are you trusting in him? And, and I share that and I want to be serious about that because here's the deal. If you're not trusting in him now and living in his rest now, are you going to live in his rest in the end? I, I'm serious. Somebody asked me this week, they said, you know, and I don't know if this is true, but they said that uh, Billy Graham made the quote that he thought that less than or about only about 50% of the church was actually born again. That means the Holy Spirit lives in them. I don't know if that's true, but it scares me. If I'm not believing and I'm not showing trust, I can go through all the religious motions and it doesn't mean anything. Now, here's the thing. Is tithing the only thing? Absolutely not. You can be tithing and you can be lost because there can be other areas that you're not trusting. And I want to talk about some of those. Let's go through more of this uh, text. Verse 2 says, For this good news that God has prepared a place of rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. So it wasn't just for them, it's for us. But it did them no good because they didn't believe what God told them. For only we who believe can enter His place of rest. As for those who didn't believe, God said, in my anger I made a vow, they will never enter my place 
of rest. We were talking about in uh, men's Sunday school this morning, we were talking about really believing that God loves us. Uh, and if you're in the ladies group, you'll get to this video later on, so I don't want to ruin all of it. But there was an example given of, of a pastor's wife um, who was struggling with some of that. And the pastor's wife knew all the right answers. She knew what the Word said. But ultimately, she wasn't believing that God loved her and that God loved the people that hurt her. Well, as we began to talk, we found that all of us were in a similar boat. There's places in our life that we haven't forgiven ourselves. Even though God is not looking at us with condemnation, there are places in our life where we've said He hasn't forgiven us. And because of that, we aren't living life in a place of rest. We're living life in defense mode. You don't have to live life in defense mode when you're following God because He's working on your behalf. He will go before you. Do you have some people attacking you? Do you have some people attacking your character? Do you have some people attacking the job you're doing at whatever it is you're doing? Are you beginning to question yourself? Well, you know what? You don't have to stand up for yourself. You have the Lion of Judah to go before you. But you know what? In order for that to happen, you've got to ask Him. And you've got to trust Him in the way that He does it. Because He may allow you to go through some persecution. He may allow you to go through some stonings. Think about Paul, for instance. God went before Paul, and God made sure that Paul got all the way to Rome because he had things for him to do. But along the way, you know how he provided for him? He allowed him to get stoned. He allowed him to sit in prison. He allowed him to go through some shipwrecks. Does that mean that God wasn't going before him? No, he was. Okay? And did God or did Paul live in a place of rest through that? Well, when he was fully trusting God and living in the Spirit, yes, he did. But he was a man. And there's no doubt, like me, there were times that he went back into his flesh and he doubted. But we don't have to stay there, we don't have to live there. We can live life in a place of rest when we trust in the love of God and we trust in the forgiveness of God for us and for ourselves. Are you trusting God with His forgiveness? If there are places where you still feel condemned, the truth is you're not. You're not trusting Him in that. Okay? Maybe you're doing good in the financial part. But here's the part where, where you're, you're just, you just can't, you can't believe that he's fully forgotten, you know, kind of a thing. You, you believe that you're going to stand before him and he's still going to ream you out for something. That is not what the scripture teaches. Verse 4 says, we know it is ready because the scriptures mention the seventh day saying, on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Okay, now this will grab some of the others, okay? Some of you, maybe the financial part, you're doing good, but you are a workaholic. You are always doing something. You cannot rest. Maybe there's a voice in your head saying you're lazy if you ever sit down or you're going to fail or something's going to fall apart. And so you just got to go, go, go. And that means that even on Sunday... <laughs> You know, you get your worship in maybe, and then you go right to getting something done. Well, you know what? If you trust in God that He's going to provide for you, you don't have to do that. Now again, does that mean you go sit on the couch and eat bonbons day after day? No. I mean, the Word says, if He won't work, don't let Him eat, okay? God wants you to work. But He wants you to take a day at least a week, and just rest. Not worry about accomplishing things. And if you will trust Him with that, He will go before you. You know, one of the things that... And, and let me just say, this has been drilled into me, okay? And it was drilled into me uh, by my grandfather. And I know some of you have already heard this. I'll try to be brief. But, you know, my grandfather was a workaholic. 
hardest working man I ever met. In his 70s, I could not keep up with him. Literally, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. When I was 16 and 17, I could not keep up with the guy. I mean, the guy was still bailing hay in his 70s in 100 plus degree weather. I mean, he was just, he was insane. He just didn't stop. But you know what? My, my grandfather had a revelation at one point in his life because he worked seven days a week. He didn't stop. He was not only a farmer, he owned several fertilizer plants and he, just, he would just go, go, go. But he had a revelation when his house burnt down. And not that the Lord caused his house to burn down, but he believed essentially that he was trying to do everything himself instead of inviting God to work on his behalf. And after his house burnt down, he really felt like the Lord was saying to him, if you will trust in me and you will take one day a week and just honor me, I'll go to work on your behalf. And I'll make sure that you get the crops out. And I'll make sure that you don't have as many breakdowns as the guy who's working seven days a week. And that has been ingrained in me. And so, you know, we were talking about going through this remodel here. We were planning on taking the pews out on Sunday. And I know most of you are like, oh, yes, let's do that. But I got to tell you, that bothers me. I don't like it because it's just been ingrained in me. Honor the Lord and rest. Don't focus on those things. And I asked the Lord about that and I asked him to take care of it. And as you'll see, the pews are gone. <laughs> he took care of it. And you know what? It took some work. OK. But he took care of it. And I'm grateful. When you will ask the Lord to work on your behalf, you can take a day and rest. Not only that, you can even take a vacation once in a while and just rest. And you need that. And God wants it. Because here's the deal. When we're always focused on our to-do list, we're just not getting time to really hear from the Lord. We're not getting time to really receive direction. And why don't we get that? Because we don't trust God to work on our behalf. We tell ourselves, if I won't, don't do it, it won't get done. And it's a lie. It's the enemy. He wants to keep you moving constantly so that you don't hear the voice of the Lord. We need the voice of the Lord. I talked about this last time or two times ago, but I mean, I need time with the Lord every day, but I need more than that. Sometimes I just need, and this is something the Lord's been talking to me about this month. I, I, need, I need more than one, one morning. I need some time just to back down and just say, I'm, I'm going to take some time off. And I'm not even going to, to arrange things to get done during my time off. I'm just going to take some time off. We need that. We need to hear from the Lord. Verse 6 says, So God's rest is there for people to enter. It's there. Will you enter? The door's open. But those who formerly heard the good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering His place of rest, and that time is today. God announced through David a long time later in words already quoted, Today you must listen to His voice. Don't harden your hearts against Him. This new place of rest was not the land of Canaan where Joshua led them. If it had been, God would not have spoken later about another day of rest. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who enter into God's rest will find rest from their labors, just as God rested after creating the world. Let us do our best to enter that place of rest, for anyone who disobeys God, as the people of Israel did, will fall. It is the enemy who wants you relying totally on yourself. We live in a world that honors that, that praises that. But you know what? It's not the way of the Lord. And if you're wired like me and my flesh, that's hard to get over. Because I want to do everything myself. Um, but as one brother was joking to me earlier, you know, the Lord's kind of set up this whole last week for me so that I was so dependent on other people. But you know what? Here's the good news. I'm finding that I'm more and more comfortable with that. I'm more and more okay with that. Um, because that's how God's designed the body of Christ. And if I will allow it, here's what, what happens through that. I feel love. 
But when I'm buying this lie that I've got to constantly earn my love, even when somebody offers me something, I can't receive it, you know, because I'm just, I'm so wired that, no, I've got to do it myself uh, or I'm not worthy of love. And nobody else is thinking that but me. But you know what? That's what I live my life out of, is out of what this heart believes. Another thing we were sharing in Sunday school, you know, when people encourage you, that's awesome. I mean, we need that. But you know what? When my heart believes a certain something and you're trying to encourage me, it just kind of bounces off. <laughs> it, it doesn't penetrate. It's when God speaks something and I say, okay, that it changes my heart and it changes the way I live. So here's the thing. Are you living out of a place of rest? Are you living out of anxiety? Are you worried that everything's just going to fall apart? If you're waiting till you have the answers for that to go away, it's not going to happen. God's not going to provide the answers. What He's going to provide is His voice. And so you have to choose, am I going to trust Him? If you're waiting to win the lottery, to start tithing, forget it. It's not going to happen, okay? Just do it. Start trusting Him. If you're waiting for, you know, your jobs to settle down so that you can start resting, forget it. You're going to keep adding things. And other people are going to add things on to you because you're dumb enough to keep saying yes to them. And they know it. So just stop and start saying, sorry, I, I can't. And that's okay because what matters is that God is looking on you with approval. It's not about the other people. Jesus, I pray that this would sink in. I know I need it, and I, I don't think I'm the only one here. I pray that wherever our strongholds are, whether it's through resting or, or finances or what other people think about us, Lord, that we would just allow you to work on our behalf and just trust in you and listen to your voice. And I pray, Lord, if there's one here who doesn't even know what that means to hear your voice, I pray that they would hear you today. Lord, that you would speak something to them. And I, I, just, I just want to interject, be bold enough to ask him something. Give him the opportunity to answer you. Jesus, we love you. Amen. If you would stand, please. We're going